Hey there, dudes. Welcome to the most excellent, most triumphant review of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Now, for those of you who don't know, and let's be honest, most people know at this point, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is a 1989 science fiction, high concept comedy of the most awesome order. Uh, this is a film that is delectably and deliciously daft. It's one of those dumb comedies that, despite its dumbness, still has its fair amount of clever moments. And it has two of the most likable dudes that you will ever see on the big screen. Uh, these characters of Bill and Ted are endearing. They are downright lovable. And uh, despite how dumb and stupid they can be, and the fact that they're not the brightest bulbs in the room, they do have a, a certain uh, intelligence about them in terms of thinking on their feet and figuring things out. And there is kind of this idiot savant kind of thing going on with these characters. And I will always have a soft spot for this film in my heart because I grew up with this movie. I grew up watching it on DVD uh, and I grew up on a steady diet of Bill and Ted. Uh, I watched the, this film and the sequel countless of times and as an adult, I still think it's an excellent movie. It's an, it, it really does stand up. It really does stand the test of time. It's one of those movies that, to me, is a timeless classic. So, Bill and Ted's Most Excellent uh, Adventure. Uh, it's actually uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, but it is a most excellent adventure uh, and a most excellent movie. Uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is a film that almost didn't even see the light of day. It's one of those movies that the writers, Ed Solomon and Chris Matheson... Uh, they put a lot of passion, a lot of heart and soul into their script and, um, uh, they shopped it around to various different studios, including Warner brothers, Warner brothers liked it initially, but then they decided they didn't want to put any money into it. So they let, uh, Solomon and Chris Matheson, uh, shop it to other studios uh, they got in contact with Dino De Laurentiis's company, EDG, at the time, and they were able to get financing to make the movie from DEG. But once uh, the film was finished shooting, uh, and it was already in the can, and it was time for a release, DEG went under. So they didn't have a distributor. They didn't have somebody who was going to actually release the film. So the film was stuck in limbo for a couple years and its fate was not good. Its fate was honestly bogus. Uh, it, its fate was either direct to video, a direct to cable, or uh, just being shelved permanently and being used as a tax write-off. And thankfully... This film got a screening, and it did so well at this screening that uh, Orion decided to make a deal uh, alongside with Nelson Entertainment to uh, release the movie in theaters, and it was a huge hit. This is one of those movies that Hollywood at the time, the, the people in the industry, they didn't think that this was going to lead to anything. They, they, they didn't even think people talked like this. They didn't even think that people were like, excellent, or saying to each other and calling each other dudes all the time. Like, they didn't think that there were people that actually talked like Bill and Ted. And they were so out of touch. But th thankfully, uh, this film still found a way to find an audience. And lightning struck. And that's why we have this most excellent collection and a most excellent legacy. 
uh, for this film. Now, it's directed by Stephen uh, Herrick, and uh, Stephen Herrick, prior to this, had, had done a classic film in its own right in Critters. Uh, it's a different kind of movie than Bill and Ted. Uh, Critters is more of a horror comedy. It's actually more of a sci-fi horror film with some com comedic elements. This is more of a straight-up comedy. It's got science fiction with time travel and everything and futuristic stuff, but it's more, at its core, a comedy. So this was a little bit different when it comes to uh, the the sort of films that uh, Stephen had, had done uh, prior to this. And you couldn't really tell because it seemed like he was right at home with this kind of material. And Stephen is a, a huge reason why this film uh, succeeds and why it's as good as it is. Because he had the utmost passion, care, and enthusiasm for this particular film and this story and these characters. And it shows. Stephen's a big reason why uh, Keanu was cast as Ted. Keanu did a screen test and Stephen immediately thought that's Ted he's great I found my Ted uh, now I just need to try to find uh, Bill to complete this this iconic dynamic duo uh, because this film and its success hinged upon these two dudes and their chemistry and their ability to be so endearing and be believably endearing to the audience. Stephen even kept uh, pressuring, and that's not necessarily pressuring, but he kept pressing uh, his actors in Keanu and Alex to be so endearing uh, in, in the film when it comes to the shoots. He called it, uh, I think he was saying, you know, I need more puppy I need I need more I need more of the 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 Labrador Retriever kind of stuff, and there's not enough puppy going on here. So, and if you think about it, that really does fit these characters, these two lovable goofs in uh, Bill and Ted. He really managed to round up all of these people and to create a very fun atmosphere on set which really showed on screen and it really added to the overall energy of of the movie which is very enthusiastic and very light and and very fun and he also was a very capable director in his own right in terms of setting up shots in terms of adding a lot of extra, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, um, extra substance to uh, certain sequences. Um, he's a big reason why the finale looks as good as it does, because he shot the hell out of it. And he also is one of the people that signed off on redoing the finale, because the original finale of this movie was really lame. Uh, it was totally bogus, and I'll, I'll get to talking about that a little bit later, but I've always uh, thought that Stephen did a spectacular and, and really stupendous job directing uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Uh, I think he was the perfect guy, you could tell, because of every all of the different reasons that I've already mentioned. When you have somebody who genuinely loves the project that they're working on, you're more than likely going to get some of the most excellent, some of the best results from that particular choice of director. Because if you get somebody who's just kind of doing it to uh, add something to their resume or they're not really that passionate about it, you're going to get a lot of moments where there, there will be sequences that look like the director is just running through the motions. And that's not the case at all here with uh, Steven. And, and with this overall film. And this is a movie that was very high concept and really relied upon a lot of high energy. And uh, he still grounded it at times enough that it wasn't too over the top. It wasn't so zany 
that it was irritating. And that's no small feat. And then you get the screenplay, which is honestly, arguably, the the most important part of this film and this film's overall success. The script by Ed Solomon and Chris Matheson. And Bill and Ted, the characters, are actually their creations. They created Bill and Ted prior to uh, writing the script uh, as stand-up characters in front of like 50 to 60 people in small venues where they would use the lingo of like excellent and bogus and they would ask audiences questions and I think they would have them ask them his historical questions and then they would answer them and and uh, say whether or not they thought uh, a certain historical figure was excellent or bogus. And that's where the origins of the characters uh, came from. I will always have the utmost appreciation for uh, Chris and Ed because Bill and Ted are their babies. That being said, I don't feel that they treated their children very well in the last film in the franchise. But um, I'm not going to go there. But anyway, I still think that this is a tour de force and a really terrific script by Ed and Chris. Uh, it takes a the time travel concept and adds and throws in the dumb stoner comedic elements and creates a blend that is honestly really quite uh, delicious and uh, something that you want to uh, go back for seconds. And a big part of it is these characters. There might, there isn't really a whole lot of character development with Bill and Ted. There's very minimal character development. But what makes th these two characters so belovable, I mean, I don't think that's really a word, but what makes them so beloved is th their endearing qualities and the fact that they're two dudes who are naive, but they have hope and they have a heart and they genuinely care for one another and they want to make things work out. And that's something that is very enduring when it comes to uh, characters. It's something that a lot of people can relate to. Uh, and a lot of people can probably admit that they've had a Bill or a Ted in their school at one point or time. Um, but also what really makes this script so good is you have these moments with, histo with the historical figures, but you take them out of their comfort zone. You take these historical figures and you have a fish out of water scenario where they are now in modern day, at least modern day for the time period in 1987 when this film was shot, San Dimas, California, and you have them interact with uh, people in that environment. And that's really a lot of fun to see. And on top of that, you have this really silly idea that these two dumb, daft, and uh, to be quite honest, uh, lovable idiots and Bill and Ted. But I don't like calling them idiots because I think that they st they're not total morons. They do have a way of figuring things out. It's their unique way, but they still have a way of figuring things out and getting out of situations that doesn't involve dumb luck. And uh, I, I think that shows that they're not total idiots. But they definitely are lovable. And... They go on this adventure and through time and they go to these different time periods and they do this in order to pass their history report because if they fail their history report, 
uh, the future as we know it is is uh, is doomed. Is 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 going to be a bogus future because in the future society is based around these two dudes and their ideals, and that's silly, but it's unique and it's genuinely funny and uh as simple as their ideals are it's still something that speaks to a lot of people you know be excellent to each other and party on dudes you know you know it's something that like everybody can relate to it's simple it's silly but it works and then on top of that in this script, you have the plot that is out there that's honestly a little crazy, but it, but it really uh, is such a creative concept. But you have other creative moments in this script by Ed and Chris. The police station sequence. I love this sequence. It is so creative. It is so uh, well put together where Bill and Ted are thinking on their feet and using time to uh, fix the situation that they're in and find a way to break the historical figures out of jail and the way that all the things piece together is honestly incredibly satisfying and a lot of fun in its own right. Now, the original story, though, had a much different ending. It was just Bill and Ted... Uh, doing their reports in the classroom and the historical figures essentially just said most of their report. And even while that scene was shooting, everybody involved just didn't like it. They thought it wasn't really right. It was a letdown, all this build up, this high energy film. And then you have this really lame, uh, forgettable ending. And, Thankfully, instead of just pushing through and just finishing things and just being done with it, they reshot a whole new finale, uh, the one that is uh, in the film today. And that really did help make the film uh, the epic, awesome, excellent movie that it is to have this grand uh, epic finale with all the historical figures on stage like it's a big giant rock show and that fit the characters really well too who were very into rock music and so on and so forth uh, and the overall vibe of the movie and when it comes to the humor this film has some really great lines of dialogue uh, <laughs> Bill and Ted's teacher asked them a bunch of questions who who is Joan of Arc? Noah's wife? <laughs> you know, like just dumb, like stupid uh, answers from, from these two dudes that are just lovably daft and, and hilarious in their own right. And their lingo, you know, excellent. And uh, just how they interacted with one another. Uh, stuff like, you know, they're talking about, you know, royal ugly dudes and uh, when they're told that uh, they're going to be put in the Iron Maiden, put them in the Iron Maiden. Excellent! Execute them. Bogus! <laughs> uh, it's, just, it's just so much fun to see these two characters and Bill and Ted interact with the time periods and and with each other and with the historical figures and with other people in their own time and even other lines like when they meet uh, their future selves and they're like what no you know if you're really us what number are we thinking of 69 dudes whoa <laughs> And what's funny about that uh, particular uh, exchange is as a kid, like many kids who grew up watching these movies, I didn't know what the hell the significance of 69 was. I just thought it was just some random number that Bill and Ted thought of. But then as I got older, I was like, oh, and then that's even funnier as an adult, because now it's like, 
All right, now I know what they're they're going for. All right, that that's that's a nice little uh, way to sneak in a, a little raunchy uh, joke in there. Uh, um, but yeah, um, so much to like and to love about the dialogue in this movie. You killed Ted, you medieval dickweed. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yeah, gotta love it. Uh, the gag where Missy. Ted's mom uh actually no it's Bill it's Bill's mom Bill's mom Missy at least in this one Bill's mom is is hot and uh Ted keeps reminding him of that and just just the dynamic between uh, Bill and Ted when you know Ted is talking about how dude your mom's hot shut up Ted (laughs) You you know just just that whole dynamic is is really quite uh, fun. The whole stuff with Napoleon and how he becomes addicted to the water slides at Waterloo, and he's, and he's to the point where he's like taking little kids and shoving them out of the way and jumping down the slides, and that that's um, that's a lot of fun too. This is just one of those movies that really does uh, represent the epitome of fun. It's such a fun film. And, uh, a big part of that is this fun screenplay. Uh, these writers were not afraid to play the fool and, and to be goofy and to be silly and, and to do some really crazy out there stuff. Uh, I, I mean, and that's something that really does go a long way with this, with a story like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Uh, it's one of those things where... It, it actually pays off to not take things that seriously. Now, I want to mention some other things when it comes to the film. Like, for instance, the method of time travel, which is a telephone booth. Now, I know that in Doctor Who, they also time travel in a telephone booth. But the writers, they admitted they had no idea. They didn't know anything about that. Uh, they were just naive and had no idea that that, uh, that Doctor Who had done that previously, so they didn't intentionally do this as a Doctor Who thing. And also, originally, Ed and Chris had the time machine as a van, as like a stoner van, but they decided that's too much like Back to the Future and, and the DeLorean, so they decided to change things around. Depending on who you talk to, Ed and Chris are the ones that came up with the telephone booth, or it's Steven. Who and I, I think maybe one of the other producers who were like, let's go with a telephone booth. That that would be pretty fun. Um, but whoever came up with it in the end, it's a terrific uh, set piece, and it's really quite hilarious to see all these characters crammed into a telephone booth like a uh, clown car throughout the film. Now, this film has a excellent, just great cast to go along with an excellent and great script. I know I'm repeating that multiple times, but it's Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It fits it so well. So you have this cast, which is just perfect. I can't think of anyone in this cast that should have been or could have been casted differently. And especially when it comes to the, to the two leads played by Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter. These are two roles that I think these two actors were born to play. And the producer of the film, uh, I believe it was uh, Scott Krupp, he and the director put a lot of emphasis on making sure that the actors that they cast for Bill and Ted have chemistry. That's something that I've always been talking about and I've always put on, uh, not necessarily on a pedestal, but I've definitely made a point about it when it comes to uh, particular films like this with these kind of characters or uh, two characters or even one character that's very integral to the overall story. Uh, Not necessarily more, not necessarily one character kind of pieces, but more ensemble pieces. We have an ensemble cast of of characters, or you just have two leads. You really need to have chemistry between those two. If you don't, 
it's just going to fall apart. And this film is no exception to that. And I'm really glad that the producer and the director and everybody involved with this really realized that from the get go. And that's why you got Alex and Keanu. And it honestly was fate because I believe it was the director or, or one of the writers. They saw Keanu and Alex hanging out together before uh, they wound up casting them in the movie. And they were uh, they were a part of like a ton of different actors who auditioned for the roles. And Keanu was handpicked by Steven, like I said earlier. Uh, but St Steven and company, they still saw other actors. But Steven was like, no, I found my guy. Uh, and they were looking for, you know, Bill. And they kept seeing Keanu and, and, and Alex just chatting together, hanging out uh, during the audition processes. And when they auditioned together, it was magic. And they were like, that's it. We got our Bill and Ted. And uh, the rest is history. But there's also other really uh, good cast members in this. George Carlin as Rufus, the epitome of cool at the time. Great casting choice. Uh, Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves and everybody else in the production were very leery about who was going to get cast as Rufus. This is a pretty integral character. And all the names that they had heard from the uh, from the production crew and from the studio, they were not fond of. One of them, I think, was Sean Connery. And they were going for more like serious character actors. And they were really on edge about like who who's going to get cast as Rufus. And uh, their concerns were eased immediately when George Carlin was brought into the fold as Rufus. And it was a great performance by George Carlin. He really did, did ground this silly, over-the-top, crazy film with his sequences. And uh, it was just great casting to play this cool, hip guy from the future. I mean, it was just great, inspired casting. Uh, then you have Terry Cam uh, Camilleri as Napoleon Bonaparte, Dan Shore as Billy the Kid, Tony Steedman as Socrates, uh, so, I mean, Socrates, sorry, I'm, I, I've seen this movie so many times, I, I do think of Socrates. I'm probably not the only one who, like, when they think of Socrates, they don't automatically go to pronouncing it Socrates. They go, Socrates. <laughs> um, Rod Loomis as Sigmund Freud. Al Leong, who has been in a ton of movies as Genghis Khan. Jane Wielden, the pop star as Joan of Arc. Robert F. Barron as Abraham Lincoln. I mean, the dude looks like a spitting image of, of, of Abraham Lincoln. Perfect casting. Clifford David as Beethoven. Hal Landon Jr. as uh, Captain Logan. Bernie Casey as Mr. Ryan, the history teacher. Uh, Amy Stock as uh, Missy. And uh, there's a few other actors and actresses. But that's really the main cast. There was a, there was a bit of fun where you had uh, Clarence Clemens, uh, Martha Davis, and Fee Waybill as the three most important people in the world who are actual musicians and artists in their own right. So that was a fun little uh, bit of casting. Overall, a really excellent cast. And uh, they all had a blast shooting this film. They really did create a very wonderful rapport with one another. And uh, it, it really does send sparks on the screen. Now, there are other elements to this film that are excellent, including uh, the music by David Newman. Really enjoyed this score by David Newman. I, act I like his score from the second film a little bit better, but this still was a genuinely impressive and, and nice score by David. It fit the, the time periods that were featured in the film really well. And uh, there were other moments that really did add to the overall mood and feel and vibe of the movie. Uh, and there were some parts of the score that really did add to the heart of the film as well and made it beat even uh, louder. And uh, that's, you know, that's a good thing.
cinematography by Timothy Sherstedt I thought was really nice. This film looked slick despite its low budget of $6.5 million. It was really excellently edited by uh, Larry Bach and Patrick Rand. Uh, it's very fast-paced, very frenetic. Uh, the editing could have been choppy as a result, but it never really feels or looks that way. The visual effects for the time, for the budget, I thought were good. I thought they were fine. I, I, I thought they were actually uh, pretty cool, especially some early CGI they used for the time circuits. Uh, the visual effects they used uh, for the electricity and stuff like that on the time uh, traveling phone booths. Uh, and I got to give a whole lot of credit and to the costume designers and everybody else who uh, worked on the film in that regard for all the historical figures and so on and so forth. Um, the production designer who was actually the production designer for Monty Python and the Holy Grail and had done production design for multiple Monty Python stuff and projects. Really a great choice, inspired choice to do the production design for the film. And, uh, and I got to give kudos to everyone in the cast for putting up with the hell that was the death box, they like to call it, which was the telephone booth. Uh, it was hot. It was, it was smelly. It was painful because they would all cram into this telephone booth and they put it on a rickety gimbal. And, and and a lot of the shots where you see the actors in, in turmoil or distress, it's not acting. They really are in turmoil and distress because they're stuck in this death box and stuck behind this green screen or blue screen while this thing is rattling around. And they also have these thoughts in their head like, oh my God, am I going to die? <laughs> this thing is fucking janky as hell. Um... But yeah, uh, I, I, I wanted to mention that because I thought it was a fun little little uh, uh, anecdote, little bit of trivia. I think it was either Alex or Keanu that labeled it the, the death box. I thought that was funny. Um, yeah, uh, the film has a really uh, great pace. Like I said, it's frenetic, but it's not to the point where like it puts you on edge in the wrong way. It, it, it goes by at a really quick pace. It's consistently engaging, despite its simple concept and its simple, silly story. Uh, it's entertaining. It's one of the most entertaining films that I can think of. It's just constantly uh, high energy and high fun. And it's a great example of a popcorn movie. We just turn your brain off, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Just have fun. And... Uh, I think Bill and Ted really do represent that whole vibe of just sitting back and just having fun and enjoying life and everyone around you. And I, and I think that that definitely does uh, appear very strongly in this, in this film. And I'm really glad that it, that it did well, that it wasn't shelved. I'm glad that it, it got the respect and admiration that it deserved when it was released I'm so glad, and I'm not the only one, but this world would be definitely less awesome and less excellent if Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure wasn't a part of it. And that very easily could have been the case, uh, considering the decisions that were very close to being made when it comes to this movie never seeing the light of day. Um... I really don't know what else to say about the movie. I've talked about a lot of different things. Oh, I want to mention some of the deleted scenes. I know there was a really lengthy extended musical number and dance uh, thing where Bill and Ted were going to do this really complex chore choreographed dance number in the beginning of the film, but they cut it out for time. And I can see why. And from what I've read and what I've heard about it, it doesn't really fit with the overall... Uh, vibe and feel of the movie and the tone so I'm glad they cut that out uh, originally they were going to have a prom sequence at the end they actually shot it there there are sequences uh, I don't think the sequences exist but there are photos of the sequence where Bill and Ted are in shorts and, and tuxedos and are taking the princesses to the prom but uh, 
they decided not to really uh, uh, go for that. And I think that's the right choice to make. It, it's a much more satisfying ending to have it end on a higher, you know, to end on the highest note possible with the concert and them passing their history exam with flying colors, people asking for an encore, and then Bill and Ted getting instruments and the princesses from uh, Rufus and jamming out with Rufus and then having that one, that really hilarious line where Rufus turns to the camera and he's like, don't worry, they do get better. Yeah, you know, like, it's just, that, that's just a, this is a great way to end the movie and I, I really would not want it any other way. Oh, and one other thing I want to mention is the film's really just shocking, uh, not necessarily shocking, but really great, fun, uh, memorable soundtrack. This one has some great songs on it uh, from a, a multitude of different artists. Uh, one of my favorite soundtracks, uh, Extremes Play With Me, uh, Can't Break Away, uh, I Can't Walk Away, despite the, you know, there's a lot of songs where I, I can't away, but, you know, despite that derivativeness, those songs are, are very different from one another in terms of their composition. Two Heads Are Better Than One. Uh, I, I really don't... I can't think of any 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 tracks from this soundtrack that I, that I thought weren't excellent in their own right. I, I love this soundtrack. It, and it adds even more uh, excellence to this already excellent movie. So, uh, anyway, yeah, I, I, I don't know what else to say about this, this film, except, uh, if it's a movie that you haven't seen, I definitely recommend it. If it's a film you weren't too fond of the first time around, I recommend you give it another shot. Um, and if you haven't seen it in years and you just want to have a fun movie to enjoy and to just turn your brain off and kind of get away from it all, this is a great pick for that kind of film. And anyway, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for watching my review of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And uh, until next time, I'll see you later. Oh, and one more thing. San Dimas High School Football Rules!